Good morning, CLS. The world is a kingdom which consists of many kingdoms. And the house of God, the church, is a kingdom. Every kingdom is run on the basis of certain principles. It is not possible for you to achieve any authority, to achieve any power, to achieve any influence in a kingdom unless you understand its rules or you defy its rules. So I work largely on five things. I'm a lawyer by training, but I also work on issues of leadership development, strategy. I have a passion for music and worship, and I also have my hands in business. So I work with governments trying to help with the formulation of policies, but I also work with citizens trying to get them to speak up on issues that affect them. I began my uh, activism as a young student. And at the time, all we wanted to do because we were young and angry was to make sure that the government is accountable. I've come to address you today on the subject, how to be brave. But let me start off before I get carried away and, and just link to the story of David that was shared on the first day. The Bible tells us if you read in 1 Samuel chapter 17 that David was just a mere shepherd boy, a non-entity. So bravery is not the preserve of experts. You can be a nobody and still kill giants tear lions apart and bears apart, even with your bare hands. I wanted to suggest that unless you understand the following things about David and the following processes, you will not understand anything that I say. Number one, that David grew to understand and to know God, and he became intimate with God and God's feelings. So David knew what God felt about certain things. And God, David was not afraid to be vulnerable before God, that's why he composed worship songs. Can you imagine alone looking after a few sheep? Who are you writing the songs to? Do you think sheep understand songs? But that is how you get prepared. Your moment of shining happens in obscurity. Many of you have wanted to shine before your obscure moments of preparation. And what I've learned in my own life is what is done when no one sees is what becomes authentic when people are looking. So, so half of what I learned reading things is I learned that no one changes the world without an idea. Number one, Christians are lazy to think. We think that faith means we should not think. But there is nothing that makes a person of faith not think. The Bible says, my mind, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And my ways are higher than your ways. But it also says we have the mind of Christ. And what is the mind of Christ? The Bible says that Christ was God. And that means God was all-knowing, omniscient. God was omnipresent and all-powerful. There is something in your thoughts, if applied to the world around you, has the capacity to transform it. And let me tell you why. So I began, I stopped despising my own thoughts no matter how little they are. Why? I realized that every global idea was once a local idea. The guy who made the light bulb started off in his own garden. The guy who made the telephone started in their own garden. The software developer started somewhere in a garage. And so if you have a garage and if you have a head, it is possible to transform any sphere in your life. So I, 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 started, I started respecting my own thoughts. Because the source of the thoughts were not me. Because the Bible says I have the mind of Christ. So I started voicing out. I was so proud and I thought I was afraid. Pride sometimes makes you shut up because you think everyone is talking rubbish. Pride sometimes makes you judge everything everyone is saying. Pride sometimes makes you not show up. If it is not you speaking but God speaking through you, 
what are you afraid of? So in the life of David, David goes to see his brothers. I'll be very quick about it. The first thing he asks is what shall be done for the man who kills this man, Goliath? And the Bible says that they said to him, he shall be given many riches and he will be made the king's son-in-law. Number two, he says to his brother, is there not a cause? Right? Number three, he asks, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who defies the armies of the Lord of hosts? Now, every challenge in your life, whether it's a giant or a midget or a flying thing or a fear, every challenge in your life requires you to ask those three questions. Is there not a cause? So I realized for me, my cause was fighting injustice. And I began in my country with others, and we were just young kids out of university. Uh, and we started when we were at university, but it is when we left university that we understood the power of faith. So we started standing up for certain things. And you know, when you stand up, sometimes the state invites you to be their guest. So in my short life, I ran a radio station called Voice of the People Radio, and it was bombed in 2002. I, by bomb, I don't mean they threw a petrol bomb. They bombed the whole thing. There are many things that I've done, and it is not these things, because if I keep sharing these things, you may be impressed by the activity and not understand the principles. Okay? Number one, you have to have a cause. Ask yourself, what is the cause? But a cause could become just mere anger, mere activity, unless if you couple it with your faith. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That means a jihadist can have a cause. That means... Uh, a xenophobe or a hater can have a cause. But if you're a child of God, your cause has to be informed by your faith and your values. Is there not a cause? And what can I do by faith? Faith, now therefore faith is the substance of things. The evidence of things. And what are those things? You can't run a cause without a clear picture of what the better situation should look like. It is not enough to want to smash dictatorship because, as I have learned in my own country, you can remove a dictator. What results is not democracy. It's a vacuum that another evil man or woman will fill. But the Bible tells us that faith worketh through love. <laughs> and, and the Bible then tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, love is what? Come and say it with me. Love is kind. Love is patient. It suffers long. It does not boast. It's not vainglorious. It does not seek its own, and so on and so forth. Let me tell you, Kenya has no problem with tribalism. Africa has no problem with tribalism. Kenya has a problem with love. <laughs> Why? Because the Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female in Christ. So if tribalism is still a problem in the church, it is not the manifestation of the diversity of God's creativity in manifesting humanity that is the problem. The problem is your interpretation of God's creative abilities. How you made some tall and uh, metallic black and others slim and uh, brownish. I, I want you to understand this because in my own life, I then decided that beyond being a Christian, I was also a pan-Africanist. And, and I know that Christians worry about this because they say, uh, we're a new creation, a brand new man, behold, all things are passed away. Well, for goodness sake, your black skin is still there. And try and go through the border, you still encounter the problems associated with it. Do you get what I'm saying? But my skin is not my badge because my identity is deeper. So why did I become a Pan-Africanist? And it's important because I began to say, when God wanted to do anything important, he used Africa. If you doubt me, in the story of Joseph in the Bible, when Israel and God's plan of a nation could have been decimated, God ensured that Joseph was sold into slavery and ended up in Africa. And it was in Africa that Joseph learned the art of governance, how to govern properly. I, I don't know if I'm making sense. When Herod wanted to kill Jesus <laughs> in the first few years of his birth, God knew that the best nursery school was in Africa. 
That's why I believe that Jesus understood love. So and when Jesus was about to be crucified, when Jesus was about to be crucified, no one else could carry the cross. They needed an African man. When the early church needed a revival, they needed an Ethiopian eunuch and one other African so that they could spread the message. No, I, I haven't come to make you proud of Africanness. I've come to let you understand that your mission and geography are not separable. But your identity and geography are not synonymous. So let me explain that your identity is you are a born-again, Christian, spirit-filled, God-loving. Right? But your mission, if you doubt me, in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 2 and chapter 3, God himself, who says there's only one church, addresses the church at Ephesus and addresses the church at Thyatira, the church. He was addressing a geographic church and speaking a universal message. So you are not in Africa by accident, in Kenya by accident, in Madare or Korogosho by accident. If you are there, you better ask the question, what global influence must I do from Madare? So I realized it didn't matter where I was born, so I started doing things not for local, but for global. So some of the things we started doing was creating models. Some of the things we started doing is getting together putting together ideas, because those who have ideas run the world, my people. And can I see Christians whose ideas have changed Kenya here? If you are here in this room, uh, your ideas have changed Kenya, have changed how governance is being done in Kenya, have changed how economics is done in Kenya, or how social protection is done in Kenya, or how church is done in Kenya. If your ideas haven't as yet influenced, your passion and emotion or your emotiveness is insufficient to do the will and the purpose of God. So I learned a scripture which is in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 15 that says there was a city which was besieged and then a poor, and then what happened? There was a poor wise man in the city who rendered advice and he was not remembered. Yeah. One of the challenges I found out is I had a lot of ideas and I have a comrade of mine here we had lots of ideas, and we're always backing them from the sidelines, trying to speak truth to power. No, 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 I don't do that anymore. You know why? Because it occurred to me that Jesus said before he departed, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. I'm giving it to you. There, go, there, go ye therefore. So which other power? There's, I am the power. I said, I am the power. You are the power. You are sitting here. Some of you are more than the number of people that elected your MP. And yet, you spend two weeks trying to see your MP. So one of the things I've learned in what I do is you don't just mobilize voice. You mobilize idea. You mobilize platforms. And you demand from power. Now, it's not disrespect. John the Baptist said, go and tell Herod. Where was John the Baptist? He was in the wilderness. Go and tell you said, John the Baptist said, go and tell Herod. But the second thing that John the Baptist did is that he sent Jesus a question that I would like you to answer with me. In Matthew chapter 7, he asked Jesus a question. Are you the one or should we expect another? <laughs> now, you don't know how rude that is. <laughs> Do you realize that when they were still in the womb, the babies recognized each other and jumped for joy for each other? Luke chapter 2. Do you, realize that, do you realize that it is John who baptized Jesus, John chapter 1, and said, this is the Son of God, I saw heaven open, and the Spirit descend like a dove. And he comes to Matthew chapter 11, I don't know what he had smoked, and he says, go and ask him, are you the one or should we expect another? I was asked that question by a friend of mine in my life. Are you the one or should we expect another? Jesus understood what John was asking. He said, go and tell John, the blind see the lame walk, <laughs> the deaf hear, the dumb speak. Jesus was saying, I'm doing my mission. I'm doing my vision. And there are results. There's fruitfulness. I realized that I was talking a lot and there was no fruit. I was being quoted in newspapers. I was being quoted. Some of you are on Twitter a lot. You're talking. You're being followed. But there's no influence. There's no change. There's no transformation. Are you the one or should we expect another? Yeah. 
So, so my friends, I learned that any man or woman who wants to influence anything has to stand strong on their values. Being woke will last you for a short time because us, those of us who are above 45, what was woke during our days looks tired now, okay? But let me tell you something that you need to know. Authenticity will last for a long time. Now, if you are not the authentic version of yourself, you can be woke all you want until you are woke it. So I learned to be authentic. If you don't drink, don't drink in order to belong. If you don't smoke, don't smoke in order to belong. If you don't womanize, don't womanize in order to belong. If you don't swear, don't swear in order to belong. Right? You can look nerdy, but there was a nerd in the Bible called John the Baptist who went out into the wilderness, was not up to fashion because they wore linen and nice clothes those days. He was wearing leather. Have you ever tried to wear leather in 45 degrees Celsius temperatures? And he was eating locusts and honey. And the Bible says the crowds came from the city to him. Crowds will follow authenticity. So many young people don't understand this. You can have an instant hit. So I, like David, I was made a partner in a law firm at the age of 26 or 25. There were three of us made partners. And myself, a guy called Nick Radnick, who runs something called Liquid Telecoms, and two other guys. So I felt very special. If you're a partner in a big law firm at the age of 25, there are people who had been my tutors at university who were not partners in law firms. David moved from being a shepherd boy immediately into Gibeah, into Saul's court. He was promoted in one day. And then afterwards, the persecution came. Saul, who he had been playing music for, and demons were leaving, was trying to javelin him. He had not done anything wrong. I started suffering the sort of jealousy that you find in the marketplace. I come to say to you that early promotion should teach you that the road is going to be long. If you've made your billion early, please prepare for the rest of the road. In life, there are seasons. Cold season, hot season, rainy season, and so on and so forth. The one thing I learned in Morocco is that be like a tree that changes its leaves with each season, but its roots are never, never changed, right? So what are your roots or what your roots are will determine how you perform in adversity, how you perform in the midst of authority, and how you perform. When David left Saul's court, he was running away. He was in a cave at a place called Adulam. If you study the Bible, you understand it's a salty place. Right? It's a bitter place. And David was looking for friends and followers on Facebook and on Twitter. And the Bible tells us that those who were in debt, discontented, and almost depre depressed, right? Distress. God gave me distressed people. And I was stressed with God. Because I was used like David to hanging out with cool people. I used to have a good job, and I won't say where. And ministers would phone me. I would meet with heads of state. And then my job changed. And my wife who was here yesterday said, Sweetie, what happened to all your friends? Because the only people that came to our house were asking for money. Or they were asking for. And the Lord began to tell me something. David understood that the people who are written off later in the Bible as the mighty men of David were made in a cave when he himself was depressed. Your depression, your loss, your rejection, your fear is the premise for you to harvest God's talent for your life. Let me, let me tell you something. The Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. It's not possible to be bold, to be bold and courageous if you're not righteous. You can have bravado. You can stand in front of a tank like Tiananmen Square. It's not courage. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Your righteousness and your bravery or your boldness are inseparable. You cannot live as though there's no God and want to show the courage of a lion. You will perish and be no example to anyone. No book will be written about you. You'll be a foolish man who died in defiance of an authority. Uh, 
Are you the one? <laughs> so, <laughs> Jesus, the Bible says something interesting, my friends. It says God neither, neither sleeps nor slumbers. In my career, I've been fired out of jobs three times. Three times. Highly accomplished lawyer, well respected. And they say, your post is now abolished. Or we don't need you here before anymore. Or they start doing politics and they take your budget. And you know I'm no longer wanted here. And each time you want to cry like David, what have I done? I feel like you've forsaken me. And the Lord is saying, the road of vision and the road of transformation of society will go through the valleys and the mountains, the rivers and the wilderness. From Egypt to Canaan, there's a wilderness. In the wilderness, there are bitter waters. And in the wilderness, there are snakes that bite. And, but all one thing that you have faith in is God makes a solution. At Mara, he threw a branch into the water, right? <laughs> when the snakes were biting, he raised up a brazen snake on a wood and said, Look, my friends, I wish I could tell you that for you to be great, things won't be bad. But I would be lying to you. So what I've come to say to you is simple, simple, simple. Are you the one? You can't be fruitful without an idea. You can't have an idea without a God inspiration. You can be inspired by your ancestors and everybody else, right, if you want. But the inspiration, because I'm talking to children of God, a God inspiration means God knows the eternity of the idea. I stopped trying to be successful. I had been a partner. I had been a director. I had been everything else. I stopped trying to be successful. I started focusing on being significant. Many people I meet want to be successful, to drive a nice car, have a nice house, buy property, do all those things. My brother, it says, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? When you get into heaven, the Bible says Jesus will ask, uh, I was hungry, you did not do this. I was naked, you did not do this. He won't care about the Lexus you drove. It's important to drive a Lexus or a Mercedes. The last thing I want to say to you about timidity and fear. The Bible says God neither sleeps nor slumbers. But if you read in the book of Matthew 8 verses 23 to 27, the Bible says, and then Jesus went into the boat, the disciples followed him, and he slept. Have you ever read that? And he slept. And they were worried because there was a massive storm, and the boat was filling with water. And they said, Master, Master, wake up, we're perishing. And he woke up, and he addressed two things. He, said, he rebuked the storm, say rebuked the storm. And then he asked them a simple question. You cowards. And you of little faith. Cowardice and littleness of faith go hand in hand. They are twins. If you are a coward, that means you have no faith. Can I repeat that again? It's natural to fear. But if you are a coward, that means you have no faith in the God who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. If the bills are making you afraid. So I got to a stage where I was afraid. And I tried to fix my own career. I tried to fix my own thing. So in 2003, I think, I was uh, part of the World Economic Forum. Or 2004, Young Global Leaders. We're the first court with Jack Ma and all the great people there, right? And then in 2005, I was on some Yale fellowship. And I've been on many of those fellowships. And I began to think, Maybe that's what God is making me prominent. I want to tell you, God told me you're just like a monkey in a cage at a zoo. The world is using your talent to show. Like Samuel, when they'd removed his eyes, the Philistines made mockery of him, right? Until Samuel got the revelation, hold the pillars and pull them down. Say it with me, hold the pillars and pull them down. So I don't want to hear you say you are World Economic Forum this, I don't want to hear you. I can say that because I've been that. What I'm asking is what pillar are you holding to pull down the vestiges of evil in Africa down? What pillar are you holding to pull down the vestiges of evil in your society down? What pillar are you holding? In business, what pillar are you holding? You can have money and success. My brothers and sisters, I realized that God wanted to do something with Africa. In this age where the West has become less religious, and where religion has become hyper-commercial everywhere else. 
the last frontier is here. If we don't defend that frontier, and if we don't become faith without prejudice, if we don't become faith that's loving, if we don't become faith that transforms societies, remember the scripture that says judgment begins in the house of God. Your judgment will be that you did not do anything with the power reposited on you. May you always flourish, but keep asking yourself every day, it's not the promotions you get, it's not the accolades you get. Are you the one or should we expect another? God bless you.